This is going to be an extremely deep dive into one of my favourite genres, but also the history that encompassed it. Also, note the disclaimers, there won't be any music clips in here due to monetization, and this is a long, long video, so use the chapters appropriately. But my recommendation is to see it all, of course. This is a complete journey. We're going to go from high life to Afrobeat to hip life to Afrobeats and beyond. So let's start at the beginning with the difference between Afrobeat and Afrobeats. Yes, they're different. Starting in the 1920s slash 1930s, Ghana was the birthplace of Afrobeat. At the time, artists in Ghana were fusing traditional Ghanaian rhythms like Ossie Bissaba with outside styles like the Foxtrot and Calypso. Many bands such as the Jazz Kings, Cape Coast Sugar Babies and the Accra Orchestra plied their wares along the country's coast during the colonial era and their music was known as High Life, where our story begins because of its association with the local African elite. Guitars were used as the primary instruments in the traditional palm wine music of Ghana, which is where High Life got its start. High Life's roots go back to the late 19th century, but the genre underwent a dramatic transformation during World War I in the early 20th century. This was to be accomplished by military dancing bands comprised of Ghanaian troops returning from World War I. Guitar ensembles playing a High Life and indigenous version called the Odonson or Ashanti Blues gained popularity in Africa in the 1930s and 1940s. Among the many well-known musicians who have contributed to this genre are Kwesi Pepera, Kwame Asare, also known as Jacob Sam, Api Yanning, Mireku, Kwasimanu, Kam Kam, and others. In 1928, London's Zonophone 001 series issued Yam Ponza, a high life classic by the Kumasi trio fronted by Jacob Sam. Paul Simon's use of Yam Ponza in Spirit Voices, a song from the 1990 production of The Rhythm of the Saints, results in ongoing royalty payments. Soon after the end of World War II, radio stations began playing high-life music performed by guitar bands. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, artists like Oto Lati, E.K. Nyame, Yabua, Kwamensa and Obiba TK were drawing a sizable audience with their mandolin and guitar-based sound. The Apaya Ajaykum featured a complete band with instruments including the finger gong gong, two acoustic guitars, an accordion, bass, treble and tenor frame drums and more. With these contributions from Apaya Ajaykum and Kwamensa, the piano was also added. The Akan, Odonson, Ashanti Blues, Konkoma and Gakolomashi High Lifestyles were the most well known of all of them. The synchronized brass band culture of the Gold Coast provided the inspiration for the Konkoma dance and drumming fad of the 1930s and 1940s. The guitar bands' high life performances were inextricably linked to the concert after parties. As far as we know, E.K. Nyame was the first artist to successfully combine high life with concert performance. A musician since his birth in 1927, E.K. Nyame formed the E.K.'s band after learning the ropes from a pyre at Jacob. The Akan trio made trace its roots back to 1952 when he formed a performing trio that would later merge with his guitar ensemble to create what is known today as the Akan Trio. Kumasi in Ghana's Ashanti region was home to Kwabina, Onyina and others, while the coast was where Kakayu, Kwamensa, etc. based their musical organisations. The concert party's framework was flimsy but it swiftly merged real-time social events, rumours, exclamations from the audience and impromptu whims of the musicians. During Ghana's cocoa boom in the 1930s, through the depression, the Second World War, the pre-independence rights in 1948, the arrest of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and the advent of Ghana's independence, Concert parties dramatized the tensions and situations of everyday life among the intermediate classes who struggle daily to provide their basic needs. Most of the big band high life ensembles of the 1950s and 1960s, including the Starcases and E.T. Mensa and his Tempos band that employed Western musical instruments, originated from the Dance Orchestra, a product of the Second World War. Before that time, white musicians and Gold Coasters, Ghanaians from 1957, etc., recruited from local dance orchestras, established small swing bands to offer entertainment for foreign troops. As a consequence of the success of his trumpet blend of swing, calypso and Afro-Cuban music with the high life, the Tempos band served as a model for many other West African high life dance bands. The Red Spots, Black Beats, Ramblers, Stargazers, Broadway and Uhuru were just a few of the dance bands who played that night. After World War II ended, 
Ghanaian's lifestyles underwent a dramatic transformation. The level of education held by different Ghanaians varied greatly. Included among these categories were the war veterans, public service individuals, and employees in the commercial business sector. Africa's awakening to the necessity for independence from colonial control happened during the 1950s, 1960s and 1970s. A number of significant leaders, notably as Dr. Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, rose to power. They were living through times that demanded fresh eyes. Innovation in music, which had previously depended only on traditional songs and rhythms, was made possible with the introduction of the Spanish guitar and other modern instruments. The accompanying dance was a fusion of traditional African dances and more contemporary genres such as the cha-cha-cha, the watusi, calypso, soul and reggae. The high-life genre in Ghana went through a lot of changes as performers toyed with diverse mixes of non-computerized instruments, non Western lyrics and electronic sounds. The modernization that spread through the city's nightclubs, bars and hotels eventually reached the countryside as well. E.T. Mensa, King Bruce and others like them were early adopters of this move. Politics, the myth of Anansi the Spider and social events were all skewered in satirical musical performances at the theatre. Predecessors to these well-attended folk performances include the Axim Trio, Kakayu's band, E.K.'s and on Yina's guitar bands. Afrobeat arose from the mind and spirit of Nigeria's fellow Kuti in the 70s. The pop music that became later known as Afrobeats also began around the time of Fela's passing. A majority of today's Afrobeats artists have rhythms and samples that were influenced by hip-hop. The singer's mashup of English and Yoruba seems more melodic than combative. Over time, songs shortened and were electronically remastered to sound more like their international R&B equivalents than the Afrobeat that preceded them. Felakuti was born in Abiyokuta, Nigeria in the year 1938. Fela was the middle child of a family of Nigerian political leaders. Funmileo Ransom Kuti, his mother, was a prominent figure in the fight against British colonialism. Protestant preacher and school principal who later became president of the Nigerian Union of Teachers, that was his father, Reverend Israel Oludoten Ransom Kuti. Kuti had a unconventional approach to making music. He could play the drums, a piano, guitar, saxophone and sing with ease. He went on tour with his socially and politically aware band and received rave reviews all around the world. His compositions were energizing and refreshingly original. He changed Afrobeat by fusing West African rhythms, American jazz and a hint of rock and roll. His sovereign nation actively pursued a way of life consistent with his highest goals. Of the heart of the kingdom that he created was Kuti's concept of resistance, revelry and revolt, which naturally clashed with the beliefs of the Nigerian military dictatorship at the time. But things really came to a head when Kuti put out a tune called Zombie, in which he portrayed the troops as mindless drones. In 1971, Kuti created the Kalakuta Republic in Lagos. The Republic was a commune recording studio and home to dozens of musicians and political dissenters. He later declared it independent of the Nigerian state as a protest against the military government. Eventually, 1,000 police were ordered to shut down the Kalakuta Republic. Fela and other band members were severely beaten in the raid, their instruments and music destroyed, and the commune building was burned down. By the late 70s and 80s, he overtly employed his music as a political tool, with almost all of his records influenced by political events in Nigeria and across Africa. A new Nigerian military regime expanded its repression against Kuti in the 1990s, which contributed to his decision to quit performing at that time. On 2nd of August 1997, Fela Kuti died in Lagos from complications from AIDS. So what are some essential Fela listens? In 1973, Fela released Gentleman, one of the first remarks by a prominent African artist criticizing the colonial mentality of his compatriots. In Pigeon, after eight minutes of horn solos that go off topic, Fela declares that he is the African Man original, as opposed to a gentleman who imitates the British. With Ginger Baker Live is a short performance CD featuring the equally explosive Cream drummer who spent time in Nigeria between 1970 and 1976. Baker immediately starts jamming as Fela tinkles on the piano. Fela sings in Yoruba on Black Man's Cry, a funk rock song in the vein of James Brown. The unexpectedly melodious Yeah Yeah D Smell, which translates to BS Stinks, was created with Baker's drumming technique in mind, moving closer to Afrobeat territory, although still heavily influenced by JB's style. 
Zombie is a masterpiece. It begins with a thunderous trumpet fanfare that foreshadows the vital message he will deliver. The zombie of the title is a Nigerian army soldier who blindly follows orders. The song was a smash, but a thousand troops attacked Kalakuta in February 1977, as mentioned before. The band and Fella are at their best on the album. Fella's original reverse Mr. Follow Follow is also great, a strong creeper in which he advises listeners not to mindlessly follow, but to follow with eyes and ears open. In Observation is No Crime, Fella declares in Pigeon that he will not accept condemnation. Mistake, a live Berlin Jazz Festival bonus tune calls on African leaders to own their mistakes. Rather of being spoken explicitly, the harmony in a lot of Afrobeat music is more often than not implicit. Performers are given a certain amount of leeway. Typically, the harmony will be quite straightforward, allowing soloists greater freedom to experiment with chromaticism by playing in the Dorian mode of a particular minor note. The rhythmic themes, on the other hand, are far more likely to shift and change, allowing all the percussion instruments to sway and dare around the unchanging harmony. A basic element of funk music structure, the drums and percussion typically drive songs ahead in Afrobeat, since the music's distinctive feel and character derive more from the rhythm than the melody. Even during improvised passages, the melodic choices remain within the minor key's diatonic scale. Dorian, the minor key mode is preeminent and the major sixth interval is put to good use. You'd be hard pushed to find an Afrobeat tune that doesn't use that scale degree eventually. It is possible for improvised music to explore more experimental tonalities, but this should never seem like a departure from the song's original aim. By the way, call and response happens in every part of the band, from the backup vocals to the percussion, the brass and of course the guitar and bass. In summary, there's three elements to Afrobeat. Big bands, political commentary and jazz plus fusion structures often sung possibly in different languages. Fela Kuti, together with his sons Femi and Sean, are known for their use of big orchestra style band in his Afrobeat albums, much like James Brown and his JBs or Parliament Funkadelic. In Africa 70, for example, the brass and rhythm section often consisted of six people, two on bass, two on baritone sax, and two on guitars. Second, Afrobeat often has political commentary in its song lyrics. Most notably in the works of Fela Kuti and other Nigerian singers, Afrobeat music aims to motivate listeners to action by pointing out social and governmental challenges. Thirdly, Kuti performed in both English and Yoruba, despite the fact that the majority of Afrobeat songs were sung in West African languages. Many Afrobeat tracks feature time structures and Durations more typical to jazz or fusion than pop or rock. Kuti regularly filled an entire album side with a single tune, for example. Now, let's make a return to Ghana. There was a bridge between the Afrobeat of Kuti's era and modern Afrobeat, an era of similarly significant music. Hip life flourished in Ghana in the 90s. At a period when rap was started to go international, a young generation that hadn't suffered during British colonialism but was seeing a brutal economic collapse started to looking up to American hip-hop musicians as a new role model. Instead of trying to sound like their Atlantic-based competitors, African producers started using high-life elements like a distinctive guitar loop, for example, or drum samples, and rapping in Twi, Akan, or Ga about regional stories. The 1990s are still considered the golden period of hip-life, with bands like Tor talking drums, encapsulating US-influenced hip-hop culture and visuals to perfection. The pair, comprising of Kwaku T and Beiku, debuted the visuals for Aden in 1993. The song's YouTube title acknowledges them as Ghana's first hip-hop group. The musical genre today, known as Afrobeats, may be traced back to the late 1990s through the early to mid-2000s. In 2005, with the launch of MTV-based Africa, a massive new stage opened for performers in West Africa. Early adopters were Mia Baga, Nato C and Sarkodi, although most of the musicians were only recreating elements of American hip-hop and R&B. Native melodies were among the first to be fused with hip-hop and R&B influences from the United States, pioneered by groups like Tribesmen, Platician Boys and The Remedies. But the genre didn't acquire popularity and see Afrobeats trending for the first time in history until the premiere of Choice FM's new Afrobeats radio shows, Born and Produced by DJ Abranti in April 2011. As a result of the program's success, several new UK-based and African musicians submitted songs for playback on the show. 
DJ Edu of BBC Radio One Extra and DJ Abranti of Choice FM are just two examples of British DJs that have given African music a voice in the UK via their respective radio programs. Beyond just Whisked Superstar and other Nigerian artist works around the time, British Afrobeat artists also emerged around 2012 and 2013, such as Mr. Silva, Vibe Squad, We Ray Ent, Neira Mali, Quams, Flava, Molego and Timbo, who collectively set the foundation for future UK Afrobeats and its derivative genre, Afro Swing. Mr. Silva and Scob credited Fuse ODG's Azonto song for encouraging them to create Afrobeats. Azonto refers to a style of music and dancing from Ghana. Azonto music originally surfaced sometime in 2010 with songs such as Po Po Body by Gafachi and I Like Your Girlfriend by Brighton Gafachi being among the first to exhibit the new style. Ghanaian rapper Sarkodi helped popularize the dance with his 2011 single You Go Kill Me, produced by L and Krinkman, which became a smash in Ghana. There's also an argument that the best way to define the current musical trend emanating from Nigeria and Ghana is Afro pop due to the fusion of previously unrelated genres that characterizes it. While Wizkid, DeVito and Burner Boy have all used the term Afrofusion to describe their music, Mr. Easy, for example, has opted for the less generic Banku music to highlight the impact that Ghana specifically had on his career. There are many lanes in Afrobeat today. Go on any Afrobeats playlist and each artist will sound distinct in their own subtle way. Some essentials are Burner Boy, Whiskit, DeVito, Thames, Rema, Fireboy, Tiwa. I can keep going. TikTok and short form videos are helping artists like Kiz too. Afrobeat production is often layered and in 4-4, four, four, sometimes 3-2 three, two or 2-3, two, but heavily skewed towards the rhythm. You'll have a single beat use tracks from multiple types of drums analogous to claps, shots, bells, rebolos, kicks, diembes, etc. The bounce is what to aim for, the bounce. Producers often use auxiliary instruments like marimbas, clanks and repeated modified vocals to add some flair. As far as names, P2J, E. Kelly, Legendary Beats, SARS and Kid Dominant are just a few of the titans in the industry today. These producers have not just worked with African artists, but the likes of Skepta, Drake, Doja Cat, Chris Brown, Stormzy, Mario, Her, etc. Remember we talked about hip life earlier, director Eli Jacobs Fantasi made a documentary recently about how Bacoso infuses contemporary African influences with Cuban culture and music tradition. Like hip life, the smaller communities in Cuba were where they birth music genres that have traveled the world. There has been a dramatic increase in the number of African students studying medicine in Santiago, Cuba since the middle of the 2000s when Cuba opened a second campus there. They learn to blend in with a society that is both foreign and familiar. The comfort of the known, however, is what inspires people to show off their native dances and songs. Something cool I read for the data nerds of you out there. Someone called Adewale Adiagbo made a white paper called Predicting Afrobeat Hit Songs Using Spotify Data Using Various Algorithms. He breaks down Afrobeat songs into 13 features that were used in the research. I won't go into it, but feel free to read the paper to see how we approach this. You want my advice on what you should do? Go on your favorite streaming platform. Find a modern Afrobeats playlist, but also go through High Life and Hip Life. Explore how fellow Kuti expanded Afrobeat and also read about new and ever expanding genres like Afro House and Bakoso. While Nigeria has over 250 ethnic groups, I'm going to end it with a Yoruba proverb that I think embodies the spirit of modern Afrobeats worldwide and this evolution of a journey we've gone on in this video. There is always a room for new things as long as one is alive and does not give up. Thank you for watching.